So we need to start out with, with what is coral. I mean, uh, I think most everybody on here, names I recognize are divers. So you've probably seen the reefs either uh, up close and personal or from 30 feet away, or maybe hopefully you're not right on top of it. But we talk about coral colonies and you hear that term a lot because they're single organisms that are joined together with the membrane at the bottom. They have a couple layers of skin with a gelatin-like substance in it. And later on, I'll be talking about that they're related to the, they're in the same family and related to jellyfish. So that type of a membrane in it. And one of the things they have to do is while they take nutrients out of the seawater, they really um, rely a lot on plankton. So you see the picture in the lower left of the tentacles coming out around the, the mouth of the polyp and those, um, those will sting and they will bring in plankton. I haven't seen these because the, most of the time they're on the, they open up at night and the uh, night dives I did a couple of years ago was before I was interested in, in coral like this. So I was looking more at the critters and other things that were out there and not as much as trying to find uh, opportunities on coral colonies where the, the polyps were open and the tentacles were out. So single, you know, single um, organisms joined together to make the colony and that's what we see when we talk about corals, we're talking about colonies. The key thing to their survival is they cohabitate and, and have inside them single cell algae called zooxanthellae. Um, they have a symbiotic, symbiotic relationship because they benefit from each other. Um, you'll see here that the zooxanthellae uses byproducts from the coral, but what it does is it produces carbohydrates from the photosynthesis, and that's what the coral feeds on. So remember um, photosynthesis and how important that is to coral health and life, because we'll come back um, come back to that later on. And that's the, the zooxanthellae also is what provides the corals the colors. You know, some of the polyps have colors, but most of it, um, most of the color comes from the zooxanthellae. And that's why when we talk about bleaching later on, that's when uh, the, the skeletons turn white. We'll talk about why they turn white uh, later. Um, the zooxanthellae make up 90% of the production of the nutrients that corals need. You know, I mentioned a few minutes ago that they do get it from seawater, but zooxanthellae are their lifeline. They're the umbilical cord that keep them, that keep them alive. You know, if there's somebody that can go way back to when they were in high school biology and we talked about families and all those groupings of it, but um, corals are, are a little confusing on how you might would, would um, classify them. Their skeleton, at least for hard corals, are limestone. That's how they grow um, as part of their waste byproduct system. They create calcium carbonate and that's when we see these these corals, that's what's being formed. That's what's underneath them. Um, but they're also plants characteristics because they have the algae growing them. The zooxanthellae are surviving in them. But they're classified as animals. Um, and as I mentioned, they are in the same genre family as jellyfish and anemone. They have you know, those softs, the two layers, and then a soft membrane in between them. When we think of corals, most of the time we think about the hard ones, and that's what we'll talk about um, during, this, during this presentation. The upcoming or the future course that we were talking about, that we'll talk more about softer ones, but not all have these limestone skeletons. Um, some are soft and flexible, and I'll talk a little bit more about them later on. And not all contain zooxanthellae, especially the softer ones. But when we talk hard ones, and I'll talk more, like I said, about some of the categories and types of those, we're really talking about calcium carbonate, limestone skeletons, and zooxanthellae 
uh, helping to keep them alive and giving them the color that we all like. So how do they grow from a single polyp to the colonies that we see? Um, there are multiple ways of doing that. Asexual reproduction, they can just do like grass. You know, grass has the sprigs that come up underground, create myrtle trees, you know, when you see a new tree coming out in your yard. You know, some of that, they just will start cloning and pieces coming out. Um, but also, asexual reproduction is a part of fragmentation. And when we talk about um, the conservation, the preservation effort now going on with a lot of places in the Keys and the Caribbean and elsewhere, out planting corals, they get fragments. They get um, approval to get fragments, break off fragments from corals, and then grow those in nurseries and then take those. So that fragmentation process, again, is a form of, of asexual reproduction. Pam, you were asking about newer things on coral conservation. A lot of attention these past few years on the traditional sexual reproduction from the coral spawning, for those that pay attention, that's um, what that term is called. And generally it happens once a year and it's down to such a science and the corals, depending on the species and locations are so predictable, they can, um, they can put tables out. So you could plan dive trips weeks in advance around coral spawning and, and locations. But what is happening now, um, Florida, the Florida Aquarium Coral uh, Center at Apollo Beach, just south of Tampa, uh, this summer, last summer, actually did controlled spawning um, separate from the normal cycle of the corals they had. And their their goal for that is to be able to try to in, induce, entice coral to have multiple spawnings throughout the year and not just one a year. And then recently, just a few, probably about a month ago, leading up to the spawning season, that's usually in the summertime, the Moat Marine Laboratory, it's headquartered in uh, Sarasota, but they've opened up a new center laboratory um, complex down in the Keys. I think it's about mile marker 60 or 80. We drove past it a few years ago. But they are now um, have been able to start getting the corals in their nurseries that they're growing in the lab on the land base and even offshore to be able to start spawn, spawning. So another advancement in how to encourage the spawning of corals more than the natural, sec, um, natural cycle. And the reason that's important is because uh, asexual production just creates the same gene pool. It's the same one, and that's why they call it cloning. But with the sexual reproduction with sperm and eggs coming from different um, corals, it gives new, um, new DNA per se of corals and when they can find corals that are maybe more heat resistant, more disease resistant, they can then try to isolate those and then um, get those to grow and create new genetic corals that could be uh, better suited for today's environment. Uh, the last thing there, branching corals, we don't see them down in Florida or in the Caribbean much, but the the staghorn, the finger-like ones that look like deer antlers all mixed together. And then uh, elkhorn, staghorn. The other ones are, are elkhorn, the flatter ones that look like antlers, sort of more, more like moose antlers for me. Um, those branch, they're called branching corals. They grow faster just because of the nature of them. Um, but we don't see much of those, but that's why you see a lot of the nurseries that are growing corals and out planting are using these types. That said, Coral Restoration Foundation down in Key Largo had worked and maybe two years now they have developed a, a new way of putting of putting bold corals, the bigger ones that we that we see that um, in pictures. Again, we don't see much of those in the Caribbean as often as as was decades ago on how to raise those in nurseries. You know, traditional ones with the branching are PVC pipes or some other framework and fishing line attached to them and they'll grow, but that would not work for these bolder corals. They need a flatter surface to grow on. So they are now just starting to 
do those in nurseries. And possibly this year they might have done an outplanting, but I think um, it's going to be in their nurseries for a while because they do grow so slow. So a couple of y'all were talking about ID and corals. Uh, for hard corals, we've got them in the four categories. The bolder ones you'll see on the right. Um, and again, we don't see those as often, but those really sort of are the foundations for it. Um, there's probably 10 or so of these bolder corals that are, that are most commonly seen. And again, I'm going to reference probably most of the time Florida and the Caribbean because that's where most of our experiences either as divers or from information because of just where we live. Um, but they're large. There are some of these that they estimated be centuries old. Then the branching corals, as I mentioned, the elkhorn stackhorn corals. Don't have a picture here, but ones of like their, um, they call them sheet or plating corals. They're flatter. They're more like if you had a head of lettuce and could somehow split that out so that it sort of all falls open at the same time, you sort of see that. Um, but in addition to possibly a single point, they often are growing um, over rocks. They will be encrusting, growing over and, and uh, taking over rocks or other things that are on the reef. And then the Gorgonians, um, a little different because they have a central bottle. And you'll see that in this lower, this picture on the lower right, it's a sea fan. And you see it looks sort of like a vein coming out and then it starts splintering off. Um, because those wave and others, um, and unlike the harder corals, often we refer to those as soft corals, but technically they're not. There's a whole other family of soft corals. Sea whips, if you're a diver, just the long rod-shaped ones about the size of your finger that could be six, 10 feet long. And then sea rods, sea, sea fingers, those are some of the more common soft corals that we see. So how do we get started on reefs? You know, corals need to have a hard substrate to uh, grow on. They can grow on sand. So most of the reefs that we've seen go back to when uh, we've had volcanoes collapse so that we have um, different types of reef depending on how the, the geology went, how much it has collapsed on each other, or changing sea levels and erosions. For those, the reef that we see off of Florida and down in the Caribbean and along the islands there, most of those go back to changing the sea levels and erosion. Out in the Pacific, you might see some of the fringe reefs or these atolls, and you go out in the water, and, and that's where you'll find the reefs, again, because the geology, the rock formations there, and the polyps, as they drift along after spawning, they will land on, on those locations and then start to grow a colony, hopefully. And now, I, I ought to add in there about artificial reefs. You know, because of you know, these events happen 9,000, 10,000, some reefs are, you know, hundreds of thousands of years old. Um, you'll see the artificial reefs. You know, people are sinking wrecks um, out there. A lot of countries are starting to do that to get artificial reefs. Off the coast of Charleston, 16 miles offshore from when they used to have the naval yard down there, they dumped a bunch of parts and equipment and things there. Corals grow on it. And then just off West Palm where we dive a lot, there are some of the areas that are rubble fields or other things that um, the corals will grow on. They just need to have um, something hard. And then if you, you go back to that first picture of a polyp, you can say, you know, how's that going to turn into a reef? Well, there's a lot of other things that contribute to the structure of a reef, uh, different types of algae that um, emit calcium carbonate, other corals, a lot of organisms there that help pull the reef together, glue it all together, so that we have this maze of tunnels and grottos. When you see a reef, you're only looking at a little percent of it, then, you know, when they had reefs die out, the corals have left, the reefs have died off, 
they get looking at them and the estimation that they range from 40 to 70 percent of tunnels and caves and little uh, alcoves and that's going to be important later on when I talk about the biodiversity on the reef and where those locations are that smaller fish can hide because uh, the photographers and others if you like to see the fish you know you got to get close because a lot of times they are tucked into these tunnels and channels and things of that nature uh, that comprise most of the the reefs and we don't see that part of it remember these if you're going to come back to some of the other ones especially the third seminar when we talk about the decline of the reefs um, you know, you'll see here in the map sort of notionally trop the tropics and that's where the reefs are the most uh, most of them are and that's probably there because there's a temperature band uh, some of the data that I originally came up with and found was like 68 to 86 degrees but that's sort of a range I think we you know corals have adapted a little bit to be warmer than that but there's the narrow band um, of water temperature and you know when we were talking why don't we see them up in North Carolina well probably because the water's dark and the temperature gets too cold um, so there is water temperature makes a big difference and we'll talk a lot about uh, water temperature when we talk about bleaching um, later on and further in a, in a future seminar photosynthesis I mentioned that Zeuxanthellae use photosynthesis to make the carbohydrates to feed coral. Uh, you need sunlight. So deep, you know, the deep water locations when you have wrecks 100 feet down, you don't see a lot of corals. That's because they don't get the sunlight. You, know, you might see them on those deeper wrecks in the ultra blue clear water that we all love to dive in if you're an 80, 80, 80 person. But uh, again, when you get the darker darker water and where the sunlight doesn't get in you have thermal clients or whatever you just don't see that there are some corals though that are um, deeper water ones and they've seen them hundreds of feet down but in general you see the, the majority of the reefs and, the, and what we see are in shallower water there's some other um, factors salinity um, what's in there and that's plays an important part when we talk about runoff Water clarity, you don't want to have a lot of sediment in there. One, it blocks sunlight. Two, it, um, when it settles out, it could be settling and smothering the corals and damage them that way. Waves, you need a little bit of current because you got to move the plankton. You need to be moving the water through. But when you have storms, and for those that paid attention to the beat, um, VB, British, British Virgin Islands, after y'all dove there, I think was when the hurricanes come, came through, or maybe y'all went after that, that some of these dive operations, and you know, they shut down because when they have a real bad storm, it does damage the, the coral. And they are fragile. You know, it is limestone, um, but that's not solid rock cement limestone. If you're ever in the shop, Lawrence has got a couple skeletons that were legally given to me at the after research projects had been done. So there weren't ones that he picked up at that shop in Key West that you don't, you know, or Key Largo that you wonder why they have all the corals. So gives you an idea about the structure. Um, but waves, severe, severe storms do damage um, the coral, the coral skeletons. And then the bottom type, I talked about that already. We need a solid bottom for the corals to grow on. Um, just what, why it's so important to, to us here on the surface, a lot of fish. Um, the nursery grounds, and you know, that's why the, the structure of those reefs, of having the, the grottos, the tunnels, the openings there that these little juvenile fish can go hide in, um, that's why those are so important. Likewise, that's why you see lionfish and other predators coming around the reefs because uh, fish that eat them can come up and, and take care and find an easy meal but a lot of the fish fish species do hang out on reefs and that's why we love to dive and see them 
for again from a fish perspective lots of fish species are around the coral reefs from what we see down in the atlantic and the coral species and the fish just multiply that by 10 and you get an idea of what what is seen when um, on the reefs out there in the indio pacific so for those that have had a chance to be out in that part of the world you've had a special treat compared to those of us who've just dove around here in the in the Caribbean basin. One of the things that's important about maintaining the health of the reef is the biodiversity on the reef and the greater number of species of fish and other animals that live there, the better. Uh, when you have flexibility, multiple species, if one dies out or gets uh, something happens to it, you have enough other species that do similar things that could allow that ecosystem to, to adapt. But it's like um, the house of cards for that game, is it Jenga, Jenga, where you're stacking things on top and if you pull too many out, you remove too many of these, the animals that live on a reef, they, they fall apart. Um, example I wanna give for, again, going down to the Caribbean basin is parrotfish are a common fish decent sized fish so that locals would like to fish them to get their protein um, for the shallow reefs it's easy they don't it's not too complicated they're important to the life of a reef because they eat algae um, not the zooxanthellae but algae and some of the invasive species that grows and smothers the corals and we've all seen stuff growing in water um, those got fished out in a lot of islands then in the early 80s, something happened and all the sea urchins, the long, the long spiny sea urchin got diseased and most of those died out. Well, the thing that the sea urchin also did was it ate algae. So that the two species of animals that help control the algae, the invasive algae on a reef between parrot fishing and parrot fish and the sea urchin, they both died out. Uh, and they saw a lot of a lot of the reefs um, suffering because of algae overgrowth and just killing the reefs. I'm not going to go through all these things here, but just to, and this is dated. Um, I cannot find a good number, but I have heard that it's uh, over tens of trillions now. But we talk about just the home for fish and medicine, cancer products, and all kinds of other drugs. The things about tourism, just the Caribbean basin on its own, $30 billion in tourism annually, except for this year. You know, one thing though that the COVID-19 has brought out is it's given a, you know, these reefs a chance to recover. Um, some countries have not managed tourism well, and we'll talk about that later, and the reefs are getting worn out and it, it allows it's just allowed the fish to come back it allows just the reefs to recover and then one thing i haven't talked about yet is coastal protection for these low-lying areas you know the reefs knock out the waves you know that's why we like to duck behind the coral head and i remember lawrence talking about um going behind the coral head or a reef when you're when you're drift diving to get out of the current you know that's same thing it's protecting the coast from these wave surges as they come through now the depressing part of it you know, we've seen a lot in the news just over the over the years recent years and it's really been going on for decades just a decline of the reefs for a variety of reasons um, some countries have done good have recovered but overall globally um, they're still declining and the large contributor is from bleaching and a lot of that and we'll talk more goes back to to environmental change and water temperature change with global warming but this just sort of gives you the trend and we've seen pictures i remember i don't know if anna's on or not but i remember talking to her that she remembers as a kid and she's not very old of diving with her dad down in florida and seeing huge colonies of the staghorn corals and just you don't see them now um, they're gone down in florida uh, 
some of the things that we'll talk about more in seminar three, and you'll see this slide again, but um, we'll all have a, a better appreciation. I'm just going to go through the picture first. The upper, the upper right one is along the riverbanks. You know, this was in Haiti, and during the dry season, the riverbank doesn't have a lot of water going through it. People use that as their city's dump. So when the monsoon season rain comes, that all washed out the sea. That was about a third of a mile um, downstream. What happens to all this trash? You'll see here on the lower right is the Manila Bay just outside the U.S. Embassy there in the Philippines. Trash that gets washed down to the harbor during thunderstorms. That came from the land that just trash in the streets. And one of the things to remember about here is, you know, we're 100, 110 miles offshore, but we're part of a watershed. What we throw especially if we're around the lakes or things, um, can ultimately get into the watershed here and could get down to the ocean. So even though we're not seaside, you know, we need to be careful with the trash. Center pitcher is a very muddy water, a very muddy river of, um, outside Port-au-Prince as we were flying into there. And that's just because of um, erosion from the land, clear cutting forest, uh, and just the runoff from agricultural base or from deforestation. And then sewage, um, raw sewage sometimes. This is not we're all sewage, it's a drain line, but there are places that still dump raw sewage there that can bring bacteria and other chemicals. So a lot of things that we do as humans have um, accelerated the, the problems on the reef. Bleaching, that's the thing we see most of all. Um, what generally happens is there's a reaction that goes on in the coral polyps when the temperature gets warm. They kick out for whatever reasons. They kick out the zooxanthellae. They leave. Uh, that's why you get the bleaching color. They lose their, their color that the zooxanthellae bring. But again, the zooxanthellae are their lifeline. That's their umbilical cord that feeds them. So ultimately, if they don't, uh, the conditions don't change in a matter of weeks, uh, the corals could die. Or if they happen, it happens over and over again, it generally weakens the, the corals' immune system per se. Sometimes, though, scientists have seen the zooxanthellae just get kicked out for unknown reasons, and you end up getting uh, the colony ends up dying as well, but primarily is due to the change in ocean temperature. And you'll see some other things here. You know, low tides um, exposes it to sunlight, chemicals that can affect it, uh, but primarily change in, change in temperature. Just like our body, you know, when we're not feeling good, uh, our we're more likely to get a cold or something. Same thing with, with corals. If they're stressed for whatever reasons, because of pollution, because of tourism, because of the sunlight water temperature, it lowers their health, their, their status of their health. And they are likely to pick up one of these pathogenic bacteria, viruses, and then get sick. Is sometimes we get sick, other times we don't. It's just like corals. These pathogens are in the water all the time, and every once in a while something triggers um, the corals to catch the disease. Sometimes they spread across the colony, but then you know, they can catch them as, they, as the pathogens move through the water. When was that? A month or two ago when we had the sandstorms coming in from Africa, the, the Sahara? It might have been 15 years ago, Garrett Smith, uh, the professor that Lawrence was talking about, he was part of an effort when we had sandstorms like that. They actually brought in, the sandstorms carried over pathogens from the deserts in Africa, deposited them into the oceans, and some of the corals got diseases that were traced back to those. Instant down in the Keys is where human sewage septic systems, the Keys were having problems, and it traced back to their cesspools, and their, when they put in a sewage treatment plant, 
that it was not functioning right. Talking to some of the state, the national environmental people down in Bonaire, one of the things they they really think is, is help them keep their reefs up. They don't have enough data yet, but they started a sewage treatment plant in 2015, and their coral biologist, who I've talked with a few times, really credits that uh, plant starting up. So that's it. That was the, the introduction that we wanted to give.